go to open up to First Peter, please. We're going to be continuing our, our work through that as you're getting there. Uh, I want to re- uh, invite you and remind you that as the new year begins, we're starting back up what we loved to do in our past, which was meet twice a Sunday to worship God and hear from his word. But it's the Lord's day on Sunday. We give the whole day to him. And so we've got opportunity in the evening to come and use our building again in the evening. That's what we're going to be doing. As of the 26th of January, we're going to be uh, uh, having the evening service. I want to invite you because a few weeks in, we'll have a few weeks of intro and then, uh, oh, you know, uh, miscellaneous sermons uh, or a mini series. But then we're going to start a full term long series on the church, on what the church is theologically and biblically, what it, how it's been formulated and thought about historically, what the signs of a good church are, what the signs of a true church church are so that we really can discern what is, uh, what is a, a good church and a false church that Christ doesn't call his own. Also, what makes a church healthy and what should we be aiming at and what makes us un- unhealthy should we be pushing away from, what our responsibility as members are within it, what, what the leadership should look like, all those sorts of things. It's what the mission of the church is. It's going to be good. It's been really exciting studying up for it. I want to invite you along to that. And if you've got other friends who go somewhere else in the morning, uh, you, you're welcome to uh, invite them along. We'd love to have visitors here as well, and especially your non-Christian family and friends. Uh, please, this, this is one of the easiest ways. If you're not well practiced and you don't have much experience in sharing the gospel with your friends, I'll do it for you. Whoever is preaching here will do it for you. Just invite them along here. They'll have some great people to hang out with. We will tell them what God wants them to hear about the gospel. I would love to see them here, get saved, baptized, added to our number, see them in heaven. That's what the church is all about. So in First Peter... Chapter 3, we're going to be in this morning. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 3, the first seven verses. I'm going to read them and then we will start breaking them down. 1 Peter chapter 3. Likewise, wives be subject to your own husbands, so that even if some do not obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives when they see your respectful and pure conduct. Do not let your adorning be external, the braiding of hair, the putting on of gold jewelry, the clothing that you wear, but let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle spirit and a quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. For this is how the holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves, by submitting to their own husbands as Sarah obeyed Adam, calling him Lord, And you are her children, if you do good and do not fear anything that is frightening. Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. May God bless us as we hear and respond in worship to God's word. As we uh, come and we've been uh, reading through and studying the book of First Peter, we've been seeing in the first, first while, Peter was really heavy, really focused on explaining the glories of a Christian, uh, how glorious it is to be a Christian, the theological uh, 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 magnificent truths of what it is like to be a Christian and all of that. As he gets to the back end of that and he really starts getting into how that should look in a Christian's life, it seems like he's taking a big drop from all the glory of the gospel right down into how he should be living. It, it would, On a human level, we think there's all this glory spiritually going on. We should be receiving glory on earth and we should be living in some kind of uh, magnificently out, uh, explosive outward way. But Peter really shows us that the way that a Christian really applies the glorious truth of being a Christian, the way that that hits the, rub, hits the road in the Christian life looks a lot more ordinary than we would usually want it to look. We all have that little bit of Peter in us, which when the, the people came to arrest Jesus, he took out the sword and started swinging because for God and for Jesus, he was going to be a revolutionary. There's something in us that says, if I serve King Jesus, if I get amped up about all of this truth, my life will look extreme. But Peter really shows us, actually, in a lot of realms of the Christian life, what God calls each of us to do is actually live, in some way, very ordinary, responsible, peaceful lives. In the spiritual realm, it will be extraordinary, it will be magnificent, it will be living hardcore on a mission for Jesus, but 
nonetheless, when he talks about submitting to the government, which we looked at last week, we're supposed to do that in an ordinary, peaceful, orderly way. When he talks about uh, your employers at work, he says, also there, be the best employer, be submissive, even if they're a non-Christian, especially if they're a non-Christian. Even if they're treating you badly, show them how much you submit to God and trust God over them by submitting to them. Of course, we always work at uh, uh, bringing justice where we are as, as best we can, but if it's as much as it depends on us, we live at peace, and if not, then we suffer for God's sake. And this week, he gets to the situation of marriage, of where husbands and wives, the way that we relate to each other, and the way that the, the gospel should inform, and the way that God wants to instruct us to be living as husbands and wives. And we've seen in the prior ones, and, and you can see that this is on the same topic, starting out in chapter 3, Peter says, likewise, wives, be subject. So we're on the same topic of submitting to lesser authorities beneath God to show that we really do submit to God. If we live in submission to God, we live in submission to the, the lesser authorities that he has placed over us. And we've looked at government, we've looked at the employment. In chapter 5, we look at uh, elders in the church, and today we're looking at the, the, the authority structure in a marriage. And this is a, this is a big question that we could ask today, that our world would really disagree with the whole concept that there is an authority structure in a marriage. We're all equal, we're all the same, we all do the same tasks, men and women, or, or you know, that's not even what marriage is anymore, it's just two people, why two people? It's just two humans, you know what, why humans? Marriage is whatever you want it to be, be together, love each other, as long as you're consensual, that's fine. Right, when we remove God's definitions, we don't get a new definition, we get a lack of a definition and marriage cor uh, corrodes. But still, our culture would want to say, why, what are, you, what are you talking about? An authority structure in marriage. That's not loving. That's not beautiful. And, and uh, that's not what you, you're looking at on a wedding day, is it? Peter says yes. And, and, and God shows us the beauty in this passage, the beauty of husband and wife who love each other and treat each other as Christ loves his church and the church loves Christ. So we're going to look uh, at, at the, the, the reality of this marriage, remembering that marriage is God's gift. He designed it. He made a guy, put him in a garden, let him feel the need and how much it was hard, how, how bad it was for a human male to not have an accompanied wife. He felt that. God let him feel that and then gifted him with a wife. Marriage is, God, is God's idea. That's why he has a monopoly on it to tell us all about it. Family is God's gift. Sex is God's gift in marriage. And it's all for the picture of the gospel to the world. Non-Christians can have marriage. That's God's gift to all mankind. But God's gift of marriage is especially seen for its purpose of the gospel in the Christian marriage. Marriage is an act of worship, so how we do it matters. It's an act of, of reflecting God and worshiping God. So we're going to look at three main ways here today. Can't drink that, the lid's on. Number one, we're going to look at the wife's duty. Secondly, we're going to look at the wife's beauty. And third of all, we're going to look at the husband's duty. Starting over there in verse 1 of chapter 3. I'll read the first few verses. Likewise, wives be subject to your own husbands, so that even if some do not obey the word, they may be one without a word by the conduct of their wives when they see your respectful and pure conduct. So here's what's going on here. Uh, uh, just like Peter has been saying, as subjects in, in uh, society, fall in line under the authority that God's put over you. As an employer at work, fall in line, take your right place in the position of being subject to the, the uh, employers. And also, wives in marriage, just as those are God's good design and structure of authority, so in marriage, God's good design and structure of authority is wives fall in line and be subject to, be followers of, be the supporting uh, uh, follower of the husband. It's, it's an authority structure. This is a reminder that it's God's good design for marriage, which, again, maybe our culture hates. Maybe our culture runs from this because and maybe you are here this morning and you kind of run or di uh, don't like that concept of wives submitting to husbands. Maybe it's because of a bad experience in marriage. That's fair. Maybe it's because you've, you've heard it preached or taught in a way that is unhealthy. 
and that's fair. Uh, maybe it's simply because you've, uh, you, you don't know why, you just don't like that idea. Well, that's going to be because of uh, you've got your mind more shaped by our culture than the Word of God. And that's okay because today we come to beat our minds into the shape of the Scripture, into be, being renewed by the Word of God. But there's a few, uh, there's a few uh, things that we, we need to remember. When we're talking about God's design for anything, but God's design for marriage, because he created it, his design for it is universal, timeless, it's absolute. Absolute in the sense of, like all absolute truths, like mathematics, it doesn't matter how much you agree with it, it's true. It doesn't matter how much you disagree with the fact that putting a turned-on toaster into a bath to warm up your bath and turn it into a spa, it doesn't matter how much you disagree with that in me saying that that's a bad idea. I don't care how much you disagree. If it's true, your opinion doesn't affect that. It will destroy you and, and ruin a perfectly good toaster. But with marriage, it, it, because it's an absolute truth, it doesn't matter how much you disagree with it. It doesn't matter how much you push back against it or reject it. It will remain being true because the designer of it is telling you what is absolutely true about it. So God's, God's design is absolute. No matter how much you agree, it's true. No matter where you go, right? This is universal, God's design for marriage. What makes a good marriage is God's design. Whether you're in a penthouse in Melbourne, very progressive, or you're in a small town in rural Queensland, way more conservative, wherever you are, God's design is best. It doesn't matter when you are, right? First century Rome or 31st century Jupiter, when we're living there, right? Whenever you are, God's design is best and is eternal. We never outgrow God's design. It always has the best results. If you want the best results for something, you obey the manual that comes with it from its manufacturer. God designed marriage. God made marriage. We read his word to us explaining what is best for marriage. And of course, marriage like this that scripture shows us best shows the glory of Christ in the gospel. And this is the design we're talking about. This is the design that Peter's saying is that wives submit to your husband's leadership with respect, support, and love. And husbands lead your wives or wife, singular, and rule your household with humility, protection, strength, and sacrificial love. This is God's design for marriage. And let, let's, I'm going to want to look through a bit more of the New Testament to remind us to, to really get sure this isn't just one alone passage that could be misinterpreted. This isn't, uh, a, you know, a husband conveniently teaching these truths. This is the word of God to us. This is how much God loves marriage. He tells us over and over again. Colossians 3, in verse 18, he says, Wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. And husbands, love your wives. Do not be harsh with them. Over in Ephesians chapter 5, in the uh, 22, he says, Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. A little bit further down in Ephesians, he concludes by saying, however, let each one of you love his wife as himself, speaking to husbands here, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. This is the big, this is the big uh, uh, two, two pedals on the bike of Christian marriage. Wives, respect your husband. Even when you don't feel like it, when, when you feel like disrespecting him, respect your husband. That's what a man needs from his wife. And, and husbands, love your wife like Jesus loved, not by word only, but by giving your life over to her. When those things are going well, like women want to be respected, and they, are, they should be. Men want to be loved, and they should be. But husbands and wives will, be, will best complement each other when the focus is women respect men sacrificially love. What this doesn't mean, and we'll go a little bit further into the text, it says, likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands. This doesn't mean that women submit to men. That's not an application of this. Women do not submit to men. Girlfriends don't have to submit to boyfriends. 
boys at school don't get some kind of authority over the gals in their class. Guys in the workplace don't get to get to the front or, or do anything in terms of power simply because they're a male. This is talking about marriage because men and women are created with the image of God. We're perfectly equal. We are equal in, in Scripture's eyes, in God's eyes. He loves us both, created both of us, all of us in His image. We're created equal. We have the same dignity, value, and honor. We have equal spiritual rights in the kingdom of God. However, we're not all given the same characteristics or ways of following Jesus. There's, there's a big theme throughout the Bible that the blessing, the godliness, the undoing of the curse in a way of being able to carry and bear children. Only one of the genders gets to do that. You can guess which one. We don't both get to share in all of the same ways in the Christian life of showing Jesus in particularly the same ways. And that's still equality because equality does not mean sameness. It means equality. It means uh, being equal in honor, dignity, value, personhood, just like the Trinity are not the same in everything they do, the roles they undertake, the ways they act and behave, and yet we absolutely believe that they are eternally equal. They are still equal, though they do different things. And in church life, there is restrictions as well, only on the sense that females cannot be elders, right? This is one of the ways that God, uh, one of the ways that we have different particular roles. Females cannot be elders in a church, but everything else is open and, and, and invitingly open for women to serve in worship God in, lead people in. So God loves using both genders. God loves his, his spirit in filling and using, doing the mission for, sanctifying, honoring, exalting all of us. And in married life, he gives us these different roles that men serve with authority, women serve with submission, and we'll see how those actually look and how they're, they're the most beautiful things for a Christian marriage. This is the design for a good and flourishing, best portrayal of the gospel. Wives, submit to your own husbands, as he says here, and husbands, lead and love your wives. You might think that this is only the case uh, because, uh, only the case in Christian marriages, that if you don't have a Christian husband, there's no way that, as Ephesians says, I can submit to him as to the Lord, because he's not in the Lord. But actually, Peter's showing here that this isn't just a Christian version of marriage. This is all marriage. And if you're a Christian wife here today and you don't have a, a Christian husband, or if you're a Christian husband and you don't have a Christian wife, well, we'll see how these work together. But, but the design of all marriage is, is best for w wives to submit to husbands. I've said that a couple of times, I think. And men to rule their wives. But it's not just if they're Christians, because he actually says that this is an evangelistic tool. This is, a, this is an evangelic, evangelistic tool so that unbelieving husbands, even the word here when it says they do not obey the word, it means an unruly lifestyle, right? You're here, you're sitting in church, you're trying to worship Jesus, your husband's a drunk. He's still sleeping off a hangover. He's going to be angry when you get home. Or, or he's a gambler. Or, or he's someone who gets in fights on the weekends. Or he's someone who's in trouble with the law. Surely does this mean that you can be a good Christian wife and you should take leadership of the household at home? Still no. He actually says that by submitting to, to husbands, even if they're evil, but refraining from submitting to sinful things, like he says, you can't go to church. Hebrews says, get to church. We disobey, We're just like with the prior other authorities, if there is command to sin, we do not sin. Sin includes, let's just open this up for a second, sin includes, don't tell anyone I beat you. You don't have to submit to that. You ought not submit to that. If a man is violent with his wife or children or family, it's not unsubmissive to bring that out in the open. It may even, in fact, be the most unloving thing ever to only let to let that go on until something worse happens, until the law has to come in, or even worse, until God brings in his discipline, anger, and rebuke, and punishes that man. Instead, before it gets to that, 
bring it out into the open, however it can happen, in, in the safe way. This is a, a church that loves women and wants them safe. If, if this is the only place that you feel like you could uh, speak about an, an abusive partner at home, do that. We, we deal confident, uh, confidentially with those things and, and we'll work in the right way to, to help you. That's our promise from the Lord. So no, you don't submit when a husband is, is evil and commanding sin or evil and being abusive, and yet Peter is writing in this culture when, when, when women would become uh, Christians back then, it was not often the case that the husbands would also become a Christian. But back then, the women did not have voting rights. The women did not have uh, legal protection except for through their father or through the husband. They couldn't own land. Uh, uh, there's, there's many. Th- they couldn't give witness in court. There's a lot of things that, that if you're going to become a Christian you, and you're a married woman and your husband's not coming, you need to count the cost because it could be possible that if he rejects you, you'll have nothing. If your father rejects you, you'll have nothing and you need to trust the promises of the local church saying, we'll take care of you. You're a practical widow. We'll, we'll care for you in this way. That's what this church promises to do. But in this situation, Peter's saying, if he doesn't divorce you, if he lets you stay in his house, he keeps on loving you as a wife, but he's evil, even then, you may just win his heart over. Not by the continual nagging, come to church, plastering gospel tracks on his whiskey bottles, right? Putting little recordings on his his, uh, Metallica record so that as he plays it, oh, it's the gospel, but rather, I have nothing wrong with Metallica. Uh, anyway, uh, the, 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 the wife will best, uh, we speak the word, yes. Once that seed is planted, and once we use any opportunity that comes up to speak the word, we let the, the life of submission and loving and, and being orderly, being, being a great wife, that will speak volumes, that he might deny the facts but his heart will be won over with the beauty of a helpful, loving wife. Imagine the power in this witness. You know, you, you can imagine some non-Christian guys sitting around the work site. <clears throat> They're all having a bit, of a bit of a yarn about their wives, what the missus was doing on the weekend. Right? They've all got different things to complain about, up in one another in, in, all, in all the you know, problems that they have with, the, with their wives, right? And there's, and there's one non-Christian guy there, and, you know, he's listening to it all, and they all turn to him and go, hey, you know, what, what's your wife been up to? You know, she's a religious nut. And he goes, yeah. Yeah, you won't believe what my religious nut wife has been up to. You know, she's, she's been great. She's really been encouraging me. You know, she's really been supporting me through the struggles I've been having at, at work. And no, she's not doing what, like you're saying, your wives are doing gossiping, running around, can't trust her, who's she with? Uh, you know, take, taking money, being irresponsible with the family finance. You know, she's really looking after the kids. She's really a support to me. And, you know, I went off, I flew off the handle at her last week, but she was forgiving and she, she, you know, told me what I needed to hear. Yeah, I mean, she believes some crazy stuff, but I don't know, there's something about her. I love my wife. Now, now will all conversation with all husbands react that way? Eh, doesn't matter. Women live just like we're commanded. The governor may not be sitting around in his home thinking, man, those attendants of Hope Reformed Baptist Church, they just make me want to become a Christian because they're so submissive. That may not happen. But it might. But our concern is our own living. And wives, the encouragement from Peter today is submit to your husbands as to the Lord, trusting that this may just drill a hole into his heart that your words can never do being loving, being supportive, being encouraging, and being submissive rather than disorderly and rude. And and that's what Peter says, that by the the gentle and quiet spirit, this wins them over in that way. All right, number two. So that's the wife's duty to their husbands and to the Lord and to themselves. We're going to look now at the the, the wife's beauty. So verse uh, three onwards. Do not let your beauty, oh, I've lost it. Do not let your adorning be external, the braiding of hair, the putting on of gold jewelry, or the clothing you wear. Okay, quick note, that's not saying any of those things are bad. Uh, uh, It's not saying that you shouldn't be braiding your hair, you shouldn't be putting on gold jewelry, and you shouldn't put on clothing, does it? (laughs) Some people try and take that and say, that's, they're all bad things, but the original Greek doesn't say putting on of expensive clothing, it just says clothing. 
If you say gold jewelry is bad, you have to say clothing is bad. We're not going to go there. We're going to uh, be uh, take the, the word literally. None of these things are bad. But to trust these things, right? Hair, jewelry, clothes, external show of beauty. To take those as, as, as your sense of beauty and value is going to be self-destructive. To take those things and place your sense of beauty in them is going to end up wearing away at what could be a healthy marriage. And in fact, end up wearing away in your identity and your submission to the Lord. Because, isn't this true? You dress, this is for all of us, but particularly women, you dress to impress the person you want the attention of, right? Uh, that You may go to a, a, a dinner room, right, and there may be hundreds of other couples and hundreds of other men in the room, and they might think that the way you do your hair like that or the dress that you're wearing is very old-fashioned, but you know my husband loves it when I wear it like this. I'm doing it for him. I don't care about the other guys. I'm doing it for him. It's even more the case that as you live your life and seek a, a beauty, that it be not for not according to what other worlds or cultures or other people say is beautiful, but what God says is beautiful. And God says here that, look, Song of Solomon is, is, is full of, of uh, a woman who be- makes herself beautiful for her husband. And there's some, man, you go into a wedding, put on makeup, get a great dress and look the part. That's all good and great. And that's a part of God's um, um, design of beauty, but... What God calls the most beautiful, if you can't take those other things, if you can't feel like the most beautiful in the room in a physical way, that's all right. What God calls most beautiful is a heart and a spirit that trusts the Lord so much that you also trust the husband he's put over you in as much as you should and he doesn't command sin and submit to that husband. When God sees that, that heart of trust in the Lord, love in the Lord, hope in the Lord, manifest even to the point of submitting to the husband that he's given you, seeking his good, seeking the good of this family the best that you can, despite the, how much personal cost it is. When God sees that, he says, that is beautiful. That is precious. And if we have a, a regenerate, spirit-born heart within us this morning, that's the approval we want. We want not to end our life with all these accolades from humankind, but to finish our life having Jesus look at us, well done, good and faithful servant. And the same is now. Who's going to call me beautiful? I don't care. The Lord calls me beautiful. Uh, the, the world will, will applaud me more if I stick it to my husband, if I rule over him, if I really nag and twist him, wear him down and, and take rulership of this home. God says, that's ugly. That's offensive. In, in Jeremiah, it says that, that that, and Ezekiel, and, and Isaiah, that is offensive to God. It's an abomination. Rather, he's created marriage just like he's created civil structures. Submit to them. God will bless that. And God says that is precious and beautiful. And you're just like Sarah. Right? You've got a long line of, of godly women who have gone before us and have shown us what it looks like to, in the face of terrible situations, Link arms with husband, hide behind husband, trust him, submit to him. Sarah even exemplified this so much that she called, as Peter says, she called her husband Lord. Let's look at that for a bit, right? Our world's going to read that and go, right, classic. Husbands to be called Lord, that's not what this means. Don't go home, find a sticker, L-O-R-D, here you go, babe, just trying to be biblical. Just, I want you to, I want you treasures in heaven, that's my new name from now on, Uh, you want to be literal, it would have been like Chadonai or something, which was the Hebrew. That's what she called him. I bet you're not putting that on a name tag. Sarah wasn't, uh, uh, in, in our culture, it's not as if we would have wives call husbands Lord, but rather what it's saying is that she used language in her culture, in her relationship, language that was respectful, submissive, and exalting to her husband. This would mean that wives were careful with how we speak about our husbands in public, among friends who know he can be a bit of a, <clears throat> right? Around people who know that he can be a little bit crazy, right? But, but we take those moments to exalt him. Defend his name because he's your husband. He's your, in a sense, Lord. And so you call him good 
names. You, you give him cute pet names if you want to, right? You, but you give him ones that stir his heart, that warm his heart, and that protect his reputation, even as Sarah did to Abraham, who was not a perfect husband. And so, so this is the biblical view of, of wife's duty to husbands in marriage. The wife's beauty, according to God, And lastly, in verse 7, and yeah, just verse 7, we're going to see the husband's duty. You'll notice uh, Peter takes six verses to talk to the women, lots of explanation, lots of imagery. He takes one verse to talk to the men. I don't know if that's an intelligence thing or how he knows how, how long guys can listen thing. I think rather it's a, when you want something to, to really hit, you put it through the smallest point. Right With needles, you have them stabbed through a point. With a bullet, you have them pointed at the end so that there's higher pressure at the point. I think Peter delivers a big one here in one single verse to drive deeper, to really send this home with higher pressure to the husbands. Listen to what he says. Husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you in the grace of life so that your prayers may not be hindered. Here we see that, that husbands are to, are to um, uh, live in an understanding way. What does that mean, right? Uh, living in an understanding way, in the original Greek, the sentence was, live with knowledge. And what it really comes across as is, uh, some of your versions might say live considerately or live with consideration, which, which kind of misses the point. The point is live with knowledge of your wives, with your wives. Back in, in the Roman day, marriages were hardly what they are today. When you would meet someone growing up, you'd, you'd uh, start exchanging details, you'd get to know each other, you'd date for a while, you're, in, you're engaged for a few months to a year, and then you're married. You know each other well. You've chosen this gal. She said yes to you. She likes the ring. Back then, it was all arranged. It was very formal. It was very useful, kind of dry. The two families would agree, my daughter would do well for your man. Uh, This would be best for our financial uh, stability, and both of our families will benefit from this. Do you agree? Yes, I agree. How very romantic. Let's make this happen. They would have a little party. What the husbands, therefore, would, would not really have is an invested interest in having much knowledge about their wife. They see her. Husbands would usually marry in their mid-twenties. Women would marry in their early teens. Okay? Very often, the the woman was seen as somebody uh, that was arranged for them to be in partnership. We have sex. They look after the kids. They run the household. Not friends. I do my work. She takes the home. She keeps me satisfied. There you go. What Peter's commanding is, husbands, live with knowledge. Live with understanding of of what? Well, of what marriage is supposed to be in God's view, right? Read the Bible on on marriage. Today's application, maybe? Guys, download a good sermon from from some trusted uh, uh, preachers on on a a good series on marriage and the duty of husbands. Educate yourself on what the Bible and what God would, would command of you to be good husbands and fathers. This means not just a knowledge of marriage, but a knowledge of your wife. Back then, you would get to know them after marriage. This would look like them sitting down with, learning their wives' weaknesses, treating them like an equal that they want to honor, learning what they like, their favorite flower, what they like to eat, all right, learning all these things that other men in the Roman world did not do. They did not have an interest in their wife. Today, that looks just the very same thing, learning what they love, what they hate, what fears they have, what needs they have what insecurities they have, seeing how you might be the best ruler, husband, lover for them. Live with knowledge. And then he gives three reasons. Because when you live with, live with the right knowledge of your wife and what marriage is supposed to be, you can live in a way that you can start acting out and obeying and, and your practice is going to look different. You'll be able to love them best. You'll be able to be a king like Jesus. Right? We, we look in marriage and maybe you see, she's calling me Lord, I'm supposed to be a, a king over this house? Yeah. I'm supposed to be the, the ruler over this house? Yeah. This is all so that people can serve and support me? No. Now you be a king like Jesus was a king. 
You're a king over these people like Jesus was, meaning that you are responsible for them. On judgment day, they will be standing beside you, you giving an account for your children and your wife, how they did, what they did, how much you, you taught them the word of God. It means that you're a king like Jesus. When needs come up, you meet it. If blood needs to be shed, it's yours that is shed. If they need to be protected, you protect them. That's what being a king like Jesus over a family looks like. And he gives us three reasons to live with this knowledge of love and service and sacrifice for our wives. Three reasons, he says. First of all, show honor to her, exalt her, lift her up, because she's the weaker vessel. Now, what, what this is clear, uh, only meaning and limited to meaning is, uh, is the context. There's two things it can really mean. is that he's, he's saying, as we've just said, women have less of the authority. So as you rule and as you lead in the home, lead in that way, understanding that she might be getting less of what she wants. Ask her what she wants. Involve her in these decisions, right? It, a Christian marriage should not look like one guy making all the calls and everyone towing line. It should look like a, a conversation, a, people who love to be led by this man. However, it does say that she's the, the weaker vessel, speaking physically. It, it means a little bit that she has less uh, authority, so bear, patient, uh, bear with her. It also means she has, you know, don't lord your authority is what that means. But also, she's weaker. Don't treat her like one of the guys. Don't come in after, after a good game, out, uh, good game watching with the guys and come in and treat your wife just as rough as you were mucking around with the guys. Right? We, we treat our wives, we step home, we treat them gently. We, we are patient with them. We, we serve them in a way that acknowledges, scientifically, the same muscle on a male's body, the same size muscle as a woman's muscle will be 80% stronger. That's just That's human nature. God designed us that way. God's saying, what do you think I gave you that extra strength for? Lording over? Getting your way? Serving yourself? Or serving others? I've given you extra strength so that you can lift others up and help bear other people's burdens. So number one, honor your wife because they're the weaker vessel, he says. Second of all, it says, because she is an equal in the kingdom says that uh, since they are, or your wife is, heirs with you of the grace of life. Galatians tells us that in Christ there's no male or female. There's no rank because of gender or because of marital status in the Lord. They are all, we are all blood-bought, spirit-empowered. Those women are loved by their father just like you husbands are loved by your father. And thirdly, it says, so that your prayers may not be hindered. Have you bought into the lie that because God is so loving, because God loves everybody and is so forgiving, that there's nothing that I can do that will really ever ruin this relationship between me and God. He'll just keep on forgiving like a good little God. I'll keep on doing what I want, ruling my family, maybe even using Christianity as a bit of a way to wrench power in my way at home. It's a lie. God gives disciplines and rebukes and punishments when we sin against him, even as Christians. It does not mean that he removes his salvation, removes his forgiveness, turns you into an enemy, but he does bring discipline in as much as we refuse to repent. If a man comes into church and lifts up his hands, but those hands have been abusive against their wife and children all week, God rejects that worship. If men will sing songs to God in, in a way that looks great and maybe sounds amazing, great hymns, good songs, but those lips have been used to cut down members of the family, intimidate, yell at members of the family during that week, God rejects that worship. If men come and, and have been neglecting their wife, and maybe it's not, but you don't lean on the side of being abusive and strong, you lean on the side of being cowardly and weak. It's still a form of neglecting the wife's needs because Scripture says she needs a man, not because she's pathetic, but because she's in a relationship that has been designed by God. 
You're there. She's carrying your weight. Step up. Be a man. God will help you. Christ will sustain you. But if you are doing that and neglecting your wife, then God will say, I'll just treat you the way you're treating my daughter. You'll pray to me and cry out to me, but just like you to your wife's needs, I will ignore. And as much as you fail to repent, to take up godly, biblical, loving, sacrificial leadership in your home over your wife as your queen, to that same extent, if you refuse to repent, I will treat you in that way. I will stop blessing you with my kingly blessings. I will stop hearing your prayers just like you have stopped hearing the cries of your wife. Man, this is real. We are married to, or we are looking to be married to if you're single. We are living among God's daughters. Peter packs it into one verse to let it hit us. Has to be taken seriously. And maybe you're here today and and you're not a Christian, and, and you hear some of this and go, man, that might fix my marriage. That's what I really need, and the Bible's great. It gives me good advice on how to fix my relationship with my husband, or you're a non-Christian husband, and you think, this is a great way to fix my family. Maybe this will do it. We'll all get into order, because I'll lead, she'll submit. I'll fix my relationship with my wife. Maybe. That's future. Right now, You first need, and what God will command of you is to first fix your relationship with the Lord Jesus. Because while you are living in your own life, ruling your own way, disobeying the commands of Scripture, you are, as God has called us in Ephesians, an enemy of God. You're a child who has has been born into an an enemy nation of God, or this, this other keeping the marriage theme, there's this other picture in Scripture of of being a a woman who God has loved, but we have been adulterous. We have cheated on him with our sin. Every human being, until you have been born again, placed your faith and trust in Jesus and begun living with him. If that has not happened to you, then you remain an enemy. And though you may make your, your, your marriage more biblical in a sense or make it more orderly, the problem is that you are still an enemy of God. He still has his his certificate of divorce out because you are uh, rebellious and adulterous towards him. When Jesus came to the earth, he lived a perfect life that we all should have lived but never could. He died a death that we all deserved to die, but none of us had to, under the wrath and punishment of God, where Jesus took all of our sins upon himself. And the book of Ephesians tells us that he did that to buy back and to cleanse and forgive his wife. The church is the bride of Christ. Only those spiritually in the church, right, true Christians are those who have been bought back by Christ, forgiven by God. And that's the promise today, that if you would simply believe in Jesus' death for you, believe that he took your sin and lived for you, so that you are treated like you lived his perfect life, and because he was treated as if he lived your sinful life, Then you become the bride of Christ, joined to him, cleansed of your sin. Jesus rose from the grave he was buried in. He now rules on the throne over the whole universe. And he commands you today through his apostle Peter and through my words, repent of your sin, lay them down, come and be forgiven by Jesus, be transformed. And yes, one of the ways that will look differently in your life, among all the other things he'll lead you to repent of in time is the twisting or the usurping of the the structures of marriage. Can you bow with me? I'm going to pray over all of us as this word goes into our heart. Father God, there is opinions all over the place on, on... what marriage should be and what constitutes true marriage and what a healthy one looks like and how we should behave at home and all these things. But God, we come and we submit to your word, not even, not even anything and everything our preacher says, but only as much as he says what the scripture says. And God, I just pray that we would be a church that is growing and healthy and strong because we have women and men and children in homes and in families that are loved and that are healthy and that are biblical. And so, God, we pray that you would give to the husbands here, all the future husbands who are currently engaged or the future husbands who are not yet married or engaged, 
God, we pray for all of the men here that we would step up in whatever we, we need to that we've been neglecting in order to become biblical, protecting, loving, sacrificing, sacrificing, provi- providing men, God, like Jesus. Would you please, God, enable us to think not of how much things cost, but of how much glory we're giving to the wife, to you, to our children. Would you please enable us to serve and live and love our families? And God, would you give wives in this room the the difficult um, ability to repent of sin, of of trying to usurp power in the home or or nagging or, or insulting or disrespecting husbands? And God, it's true, every single husband in this room has deserved disrespect on a human level. None of us are perfect or even close to being ideal. But God, as your command comes into a fallen world, you take that into account. God, would you please enable the wonderful women among us to be able to live out in obedience, trusting in your spirit and trusting that, that living according to your design will bring great fruit. Lord, may, may we have these well-structured, growing, ever being sanctified, never perfect, but growing in purity marriages, God. And would you please, Lord, give, give faith to those who don't believe today, to those who have maybe been a part of the church in the past but have left, have rejected, have thrown off the authority of your word over their life. Lord, would you please speak to those who have maybe been sitting in church most of their lives but have not yet been given the gift of faith to repent and believe in Jesus. Would you please, Lord, meet those who are here, maybe visiting for the first time and do not know you, God. We pray that you would fill their life with your love in the gospel of Jesus, your death in their place, your resurrection to give them new life, and your ruling now in heaven for our good. Would you please make them your people? Add them to our church, save their souls, and keep them until the day of your reappearing. God, we thank you for all of this. We praise you, we glorify you, we thank you for your word. And everybody said, amen.